Good morning world, this is Pastor John Fisherman Crenwell of GRV TV and uh, recording this, uh, this session is my good brother and mate Chris. At the Beverly Hills. G'day Chris. <laughs> yeah. And so this morning we're going to be talking about one of the sins of, of Solomon, David's son. We've just done the story of the two sins of David's and he did many other sins. And he was the apple of God's eye. So now we're going to deal with his son. That this was from his relationship and marriage of Bathsheba. Okay, and and so Solomon <coughs> he built the temple. Now David tried to start to build the temple, but David was not a temple builder. He was a fighter. He was a warrior. So God didn't anoint him for that, but He anointed Solomon to build the temple. God's temple. He built his own too. I think it was bigger than God's temple, if I remember. Okay. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Uh, and so let's have a look here in the Bible and let's have a look at this story. You see, King Solomon, what did he do that was so bad? Well, he was said to have sinned by acquiring many foreign wives. Putting a, a, a word on the foreign wives. Okay. So let's have a look at what happened. What was God's punishment for him? In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse um, 30 to 34. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take ten of these pieces, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon. I'll give Ten of the tribes to you, but I will leave them one tribe for the sake of my servant David, for the sake of Jerusalem. See, God called David his servant. He was totally forgiven. David's in heaven, Chris. God forgave him his, his sins. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that good news? So, to Solomon was the son of Bathsheba. Yes. The second son, maybe. Oh, oh. But I will leave him one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. For Solomon has abandoned me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemos, the god of Moab, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites. He has not followed my ways and done what is pleasing in my sight. He has not obeyed my decrees and regulations as David his father did. But I will not take the entire kingdom from Solomon at this time, at this time, for the sake of my servant David and the one whom I chose and who obeyed my commands and decrees. I will keep Solomon as a leader for the rest of his life. But I will take the kingdom away from his son and give ten of the tribes to you. Okay. So God took all those tribes away from Solomon and he let him have one more for the sake of his Father David. Okay, and for the sake of Jerusalem. Okay, so what a great punishment. But look at Solomon. What was he doing? What was he thinking? I mean, gosh, worshipping all those idols. I was just wondering, brother. He was uh, the wisest man on earth or wisest king on earth but still committed a sin it's really hard to comprehend isn't it Chris <laughs> the, the wisest man apart from Jesus that yes. trod the face of the earth the queen of Sheba came to see him all the way from somewhere in Africa all the way there to see him the wisest man in the world then he wrote um the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and all this wisdom in there. Very intelligent man, wise, yeah. wise. You know, you can be a university graduate, top of the class every year from grade one right through to university graduate, being one. And yet, you still don't have it all together. <laughs> you still haven't got it together. We're born into sin. We're born to sin, Chris. It's inside our DNA, maybe. It's in our DNA. Because of, because the, of Adam. 
Original sin. Original sin. Yep, we inherited that. And, but still, it's hard for us to understand and comprehend that how such a wise man could be so stupid, so foolish to worship these idols. Idolatry is mentioned almost a thousand times in the Bible. If you remember Moses' people, his brother Aaron got them to worship this golden calf while he was up on the, on the mount and talking to God 40 days and 40 nights. And it came down and found them and he said to his brother Aaron, Aaron, why have you caused our people to do this great sin? So here we see idolatry is called a great sin. It's not, it's not just a small thing. It's just not something that God will just brush away. No. It's a great sin. It, it's a mockery and an insult against our holy God. I mean, how can a thing made out of wood by human sinful men, by their hands, their, their craft, their, their art, their, their work, that they carved out in wood or they make it out of metal or bronze or coal or copper or whatever. How can they do anything? The Bible says they have eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, mouths that cannot speak, noses that can't breathe. They have hands and legs that can't do anything. And with the rest of the the tree that they make the idol from they burn it to make a fire to cook their meal and they worship this stupid foolish little man carved thing called an idol to represent God <laughs> I can't work that out you see all the idols around here in the different churches you, you go to um, one country like Thailand, I've been there, and there's all these big fat Buddhas. Look at the people. Love that. Believe in it. How can they? And you go to Japan, you'll find all these different Buddhas all over the place. China. Asian countries. And then you find the Roman Catholics have got all these idols with Jesus and, and Mother But Mary. Buddhism and Hinduism came before Christ. It was the oldest one of the oldest religions, Buddhism and Hinduism. Yeah, well, Christianity was not yet existing. Well, the reason why is that that was God's next plan. You see, first of all, we see the days of Noah. He looked down and he found one righteous man, so he, he got Noah to build this big boat in the middle of the desert and to save the people. But the people didn't believe. And listen, they didn't believe the boat was coming. And so they perished in the flood and went to hell. They've been there ever since. Only eight people survived that believed. And then we see it just got worse. So what did God do? He sent us Jesus Christ. We've just celebrated Easter. Just last month. The death and resurrection of the Saviour. The only Saviour. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. John 14, 6. That's the key. And so if you're not serving, worshipping, and believing and following Jesus Christ, then you won't get to heaven. It's impossible. There's over 4,000 plus different religions in the world and none can forgive you, none can save you. And most of them are into idolatry. So we see here uh, King Solomon into idolatry after building the temple, God's holy temple, after all those wise sayings of his, and he starts to worship idols, from how many different places? About three or four different places. I have a question, brother. Only one? You, you read that uh, story about King Solomon. And you mentioned that God was not happy with what he did. Yeah. Who wrote that book? Who wrote that story? Who wrote that, uh, that story that you've, been, that you've read a few minutes ago? Who wrote it? Who was the author of that book? Solomon wrote it. Solomon, so he judged himself that God was not happy? Yep. So he wrote a story about himself and tell our... Like audience. David. 
You write much of the book of Psalms. Um, so he was guilty. That's why he said that God was not happy. Well, you when, have a look at the when he wrote the story. Proverbs. Proverbs was written by Solomon, right? And the kings. Yeah. Book of and kings. Ecclesiastes. So what was the message all about? It's just amazing wisdom of the greatest wise man of the world since uh, Christ was the most wisest. But and then he does idolatry. And so it was, a, it was his main sins were idolatry and acquiring too many wives. I think the message is this is only my opinion that he intentionally did that to send message to the world, to the people, that idolatry is a no-no to God. Well, I want to make a comparison here, Chris. Unless otherwise he didn't do it, then there was no message. Well, the thing is, whatever has happened in our past, our history, is there is a message for us. To encourage us, to show us where these great men went wrong, to show us what they did right. And so they're there as an example for us today. All of our history, the Old Testament and the New, is examples for us today to follow. And we, we have a choice. God has given us a choice to do wrong, to do right. And he leaves it up to us. Okay, so we have to make the choice. And there's so many choices in our life to make. I mean, how many bad ones have you made, Chris? How many bad ones have I made? Countless. But when we repent, of our sin, we confess to God, He forgives us. And we must also convert from our religion. Otherwise, there's no forgiveness of sins. You cannot be religious and go to heaven. There's no religious people in heaven. That's why the Bible says to convert. So to repent is to do a, a 180 degree T, a 180 degree turn of your life. To go in a complete opposite direction that you've been going all your life, no matter how old you are or young you are. And when you do that, God forgives you. And then you start following Jesus to the best of your ability with God's help. We cannot do that with God's help. And we will still continue to make mistakes, like David, like Solomon. We will still continue to make mistakes. We will still sin. As long as we hold a short account with God, He will forgive us. Okay? God is a forgiving God, a merciful God, a God full of grace. Grace is the undeserved forgiveness factor of God. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We all deserve to go to hell. None of us deserve to go to heaven, Chris. Amen? I have a question, brother. Because sometimes people uh, are very religious. So this guy is very religious. This lady is very religious. Is that a good adjective or no because when, yes, when you say religious it couples with good traits right good traits meaning it does kind in, person in or, way. yeah but well, it's not good to be religious no you see that most people call born again Christians religious very religious because they don't know the difference between religion the, and like you you always go to church and then people will well, describe you, this guy is very religious. religious. yes. And so the thing is this, is that most of the it people... It associates with closeness to God, right? Well, that's what they think. But you see, because it's like that, the word Christian is a very misused and abused word. The real meaning of Christian. Now, there's, most of the people of the world do not understand there is a big difference between religion and Christianity. You see, religion is based on fear, okay? But Christianity is based on love. And perfect love casts out all fear, the Bible says. And so when you receive the love of God, that's through his forgiveness and his mercy and grace, then you are born again, you become a born again Christian, a new person in Christ. Behold, the old has passed away, and you has come, the Bible says. So all your past is forgiven. And that even when you sin, as a born-again Christian, like you have, like I have, we say, <coughs> Father, 
I'm so sorry for what I've just done against you, that sin I've just done against you. But thank you, Jesus, for what you did on that cross, that you died and rose again and shed your precious blood for the sin I've just done against you. Amen? Amen. So you see, we are very blessed to be born again. But we must always keep a very short account of our sin with God. Always be willing to repent. So I cannot describe you as a religious man. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Christian. Yeah. The true meaning of a Christian. Born again. And many, yes, born again. Many, many uh, Roman Catholics here in the Philippines say that I'm Christian. Oh, and I've heard this so often. So I said, oh, you mean you're a, a Roman yeah, Christian, Roman Catholic? Yes, sir. They were always. Uh, they are always uh, uh, offended when you tell them that are you Christian? No, yes, of course I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic, and I believe in Christ. That's why I'm a Christian. It's offending for well, people to tell the Catholics, well, "Are you Christian?" <laughs> well, myself, I, I don't find they are any offences when I, I preach against religion. I preach against Pope Francis and idols and Mary and. Jesus on a cross, you know, on their necklaces and all the rest of it, and all all their stuff in the, the practice their practices in the church that aren't in the Bible. And I I find some of them come up to me and shake me by the hand when we speak to a big group, and they'll come up and say, "Thank you, sir, for telling us the truth," because Jesus said, "You shall know the truth, and you shall set you free." But in 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 Australia and New Zealand, where I spent half my life. When I preached the gospel on the street corners for 30 plus years, they threw eggs at me, a lot of water for 30 plus years, all the time. Some punched me in the face and spat at me close range, and even women with their fists in my face, cursing me and telling me to go to hell. Um, it, they were offended. You see, in Australia New Zealand, it's mostly atheists. So they're very offended. And then you tell the religious people, they get offended too. And so... Um, that's why we are persecuted for our faith when we preach against the system. We preach against religion. We preach against the sin. We preach uh, against this stuff that can't get you to heaven. And so it's offensive in Australia and New Zealand and many places over the world. But in the Asian countries, not so much. And here in the Philippines, uh, it's totally opposite to my country. People are thankful that you tell them the truth. And you've got to do that in love. You mustn't condemn people. You see, there's some preachers will condemn you and make you feel really bad. Sure, we must feel bad that we've sinned against the Holy God. That's right. But um, we must do it the right way. There's always a right and a wrong way to preach the gospel. So we must preach with love. Preach like Jesus did. Preach His Word. You can't go wrong. Okay. So in your country, you're going to do this? Like this in, the, in our country? You'll be spunk or oh, like you'll be booed or whatever? Oh, yes. Throw eggs at you. Get out of my way, brother. Oh, they abuse you verbally and fist in your face here and punch <laughs> you and spit on you. Yeah, I had that for 30 plus years. But, you see, it didn't, didn't stop me from doing it because actually it went in reverse. It backfired on them because... I had, my, my people of my country had to hear the good news. And so I preached longer, louder, and more. <laughs> so Australians are more Catholics than born again? I'd say about the same. Uh, well, let's say we'll put, say about 5% religious people in Australia and about 5% born again, 90% atheists. And the rest? Sorry, Aussies. 90% are atheists? I'd say 90% easy. Oh, it's very sad, huh? Well, you see, there's only two types of people in the world, believers and unbelievers. But we better finish off about Solomon here. Um, I so, let's have a look. Let's have a look at... Um, yeah, it's a very sad story about Solomon. You see... How can I put it? Solomon's devotions to the Lord was weakened because he clung to his wife, his wives, in love and allowed their pagan idolatry, 
idolatry, to turn his heart away from God. To turn his heart away from God. So Solomon fell from God's grace. There's no record of his repentance. Not a good ending. So my no, no record of repentance like King David? No. So maybe he went I to hell. I couldn't find it. Maybe he went to hell. <laughs> well, you don't like to say that, so I'm not his judge, but the thing is... Maybe, only maybe. So, if you've been an adulterer and a murderer, God will forgive you. But if, you, if you're still into idolatry and your sin, God won't forgive you. So, in other words, we're doing comparison here, be a David, not a Solomon. <laughs> okay? And so, so, now it's time to wind up and, and, and show you how you can be forgiven. Okay, you've heard the message today that God forgives you. He forgives and forgets. He says, I will remember your sin no more. And so, right now I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. Because the Bible says to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, not some religious leader. All their pagan gods, idols. But if you confess Jesus Christ, the Jesus of the Bible, with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Okay? Romans 10, 9. You cannot go wrong with the Bible. It's, it's full of God's truth. It's God's way of salvation is through Jesus Christ shedding his perfect sacrificial blood on that cross, dying for your sins and being risen again. And he's coming back very soon. Will you be ready for his return? So if you want to be ready for his return and don't get left behind with 66 here or here, then please pray this prayer. Dear God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm truly sorry for sinning against you, a holy God, but I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again on the third day for all my sin. I repent for my sin right now and I'll willingly turn away from my religion that cannot forgive my sins nor save me from hell to follow only you, my Lord Jesus. This I promise you for the rest of my life. Thank you, my Lord, for forgiving my sins and saving me from hell. Please make me the person you want me to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you've said amen to that prayer, well, welcome, welcome all to God's forever family. You've made the best choice of your life. Just do your best with God's help from now on. Now, what do you do? Is there a change? Yes. You're a new person in Christ. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new person, the oldest passed away, behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So now you're a new person. God has washed away all your sins. He'll remember your sins no more. You are now perfect in His sight. You won't be perfect until you actually go to heaven. Because we're still in living in this sin sick world. And we still have our sin. But now we are aware of our sin. And we'll try not to sin as much as we did before. And we must keep repenting. And daily repentance. And, and so that we are forgiven all the time. Keep in that state of forgiveness. Okay, so now you start to read your Bible a chapter a day. Keeps the devil away. Okay, one chapter starting in the Gospel of John in the New Testament, it cleanses you and God speaks to you. That's an understatement. We haven't got time for that one. So read one chapter a day starting in the New Testament, the Gospel of John. After three months, try two chapters for the next nine months, one in the Old Testament, one in the New, to give you a balanced spiritual diet. It's so important. We cannot express the importance of reading your Bible daily. Amen, Chris? Amen. Amen. There's no born-again Christians in heaven that didn't read the Bible daily. Okay? We must. In the, in the Philippines here, we use this word, ka'ilangan. It's a must. You must read your Bible daily. That's every day. So one chapter for three months, two chapters for the next nine months. That's pretty easy. It takes three or four minutes to read one chapter of your busy day. Okay, then talk to God this way. Never do the upside down cross, which some religions do. Do not do that. It's a mockery and insult to holy God. It's not in the Bible. Uh, it's been designed by sinful man to mock and insult the holy God. So lift up your holy hands, the Bible says. And then point people to Jesus. We must not allow our loved ones to go to hell. Amen? Amen. We must not allow our loved ones to go to hell. Our friends, our family our relatives, the whosoever, tell them about Christ is the only Saviour. 
okay, and go to a born again church and grow in the things of the God of the Bible. So God bless you all real good. All of you have made that stand now. So now you're saved. Your sins are forgiven. You're a child of God. You're born again. You're one of his ambassadors. And um, you're uh, one of his um, masterpieces. You're a child of God. So just do your best with God's help. God bless you real good. This is Pastor John and Chris signing off for today. See you next time. God bless you. Thank you, brother.